Hi. Brachiopods are a fascinating group of invertebrates, fossils, that can tell us a lot about an environment in which a rock was deposited. These fossils, which are of uh, two shells uh, that are hinged together, a similar mode of life or similar design, I suppose, for the shell uh, as a bivalve, but these are actually very, very different organisms, lived in a more restricted environment than the bivalves. They're benthonic. They live on the seabed, usually uh, immobile. The two shells are unequal in size. There's one bigger than the other. And they're made of a mixture of uh, either chitin and calcium phosphate, like sort of fingernail and bone material, or perhaps the more common calcium carbonate. Most of these are fairly small organisms. You can get some unusual ones that are much bigger, but most of them are sort of hand size uh, or smaller fossils. Their mode of life saw them either attached to the seabed, lying on the seabed, or maybe just uh, burrowing to a very shallow depth uh, into the sediment on the seabed. Their morphology, once we know what we're looking for, is quite distinctive. These are the different features that you need to be able to recognise and identify. You can see from these diagrams that the two shells with the different shades of grey are different sizes. So there's no symmetry between the valves. There is, however, a plane of symmetry running down uh, through the middle of the valve. So each side of the valve, each side of the shell, is symmetrical. Most bivalves aren't like this. Other features we need to be able to recognise are the hinge lines, where the two shells uh, actually are locked together. The pedicle opening, which not all brachiopods have, but where they do have it is very distinctive. This sort of hole in the shell, uh, in this part of the shell that sticks out called the foramen, where like a fleshy stalk um, was attached to the shell that was also then attached to the seabed to allow the brachiopod to be attached to the seabed and to allow it uh, to feed and to breathe in place. A brachiopod survived by opening and closing its shell. Open its shell to breathe and to feed and to close it to protect itself. There were two sets of muscles attached to the inside of the shell to allow for this opening and closing. We have the diductor muscles. This muscle, shaded in green on the diagram, will contract to uh, open the shell. When the animal wanted to close its shell, it would contract its adductor muscle. Most brachiopods that we find are what we call articulate brachiopods, like the one on the left. Articulate brachiopods have uh, hinge and sort of teeth uh, to and sockets that sort of lock the shell. Uh, hinge together um, so it can open and close fairly easy. Inarticulate brachiopods, uh, like the one on the right, are just held together by uh, the soft parts, by the muscles. Now, inarticulate brachiopods are one of the earliest ones to have evolved and they're still going today. We saw far more um, evolution and extinction of the articulate brachiopods, and as a result, they tend to be more useful for us.
A lot of these species, though, did live for a long time. We don't really use brachiopods very much for dating. They do tell us a lot, though, about the fasces, about the environment in which they, were, uh, they lived. The group isn't as uh, common as now as it was uh, certainly back in the Paleozoic. They suffered significantly, as you can see uh, at some of the major mass extinctions. The Permian, uh, as with so many other species, virtually wiped out the uh, the brachiopods. They're also fairly uh, heavily affected by the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction. They evolved as part of the Cambrian explosion and it became very, very diverse. We see only a, a, a small handful of survivors still living to get today. There were various adaptations, though, linked to the environment in which they lived. Some of these brachiopods must have lived in very high energy, turbulent water. We recognize these because of perhaps a large pedicle opening. So there's a, a very strong pedicle to attach them to the seabed. Or maybe strongly ribbed valves to, to give a corrugated, very strong shell for not a great deal of weight. If the two shells join with this sort of folded uh, shape, that might actually allow them to lock together and also allows the animals to control the, um, the sediment and the amount of water that comes into the shell more easily. The shell also might just be thick and heavy to prevent it um, from being damaged. An example of this would be the rhynchonellids. Very common, um, particularly when we go back into the, uh, into the Paleozoic. Um, a very distinctive shell with this um, sort of strongly ribbed shell. The pedicle on this one, though, isn't particularly large. Some uh, brachiopods are adapted to very quiet water. They might have uh, a large surface area, uh, so the 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 shell is sort of spread out a little bit, forming wings to stop it sinking. Uh, it might be quite smooth surface or, or fairly weakly ribbed. It doesn't need to be that strong uh, if it's not going to get knocked about too much by the by the currents. And these ones may not have may not have a pedicle, although some of them do. This is a very distinctive um, brachiopod. Uh, called the uh, Spirifer. Spirifer lived sort of just in the seabed. Um, you can see the the long straight hinge and the sort of the winged appearance of this. Uh, some of these fossils have been called uh, uh, butterfly fossils or butterfly brachiopods. Designed to help it to to spread out. Another group with this, uh, possibly linked to this uh, calmer water, are the terebratulids. Quite common today, um, as far as brachiopods go, but we see uh, a distinctive smooth shape uh, to the shell. Although these ones do have um, a fairly, fairly obvious pedicle opening, as you can see in these photographs. There are some brachiopods that lived in sort of very soft, muddy um, seabeds. We see some of the larger brachiopods, ones that um, almost like saucer shaped, uh, to give uh, to spread the weight across uh, some very soft sediment, stop it sinking. Uh, you might see some ribs or spines coming off them. Um, we might also see part of the shell extended to allow them to feed, even if it was buried in mud. Producted is a good example of this. 
we can find fossils of this, for example, down at Ogmore by Sea. A very quite a large, um, you know, size of your hand um, type of fossil. These fossils are an interesting group. They do give us a lot of information from their morphology about the environment. And it's that really that makes it, makes it important for us to be able to identify these and describe these accurately. Come up with your interesting question that you can bring into class. I'll see you there.